It's the healing touch. So I want everybody to hold up your hands. Look at your hands. What do you see? Are they smooth? Are they calloused? <laughs> are the fingers long or are the fingers short? Do they show age? They look like a baby's bottom? <laughs> no. Are they the hands of a hard worker? Or are these the hands that have been shielded from a lot of physical activity and hard work? And are these the hands that are ready to bring in the harvest? What do you see when you look at your hands? Do you know what God sees when he looks at your hands? He sees unlimited potential in blessings and in miracles. Here's what God saw in the hands of Jesus. Find it in John 35. The Father loved the Son and placed everything in his hands. In his hands. In his hands, Jesus was able to take five loaves of bread and two fish feed thousands of people. In his hands, he was able to stop a funeral procession and he touched the body of a little boy. And by doing so, he changed the mother's life, gave her joy, gave new life to the little boy. In his hands, he has resurrection power. Total control over death in his hands. And this is what Jesus says about your hands. In John 14, 12, Jesus says this about your hands. We already know what God says about his hands. I tell you the truth, anything who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. So Jesus is saying that we can do greater works with our hands. Just look at those hands. You can do greater works than Jesus. Second Timothy 1.6 tells us this. We are told to fan the flames of our spiritual gifts by laying on of hands. 1 Timothy 4, 14 reminds us, it says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift you receive through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. His hands wield power. We have to use our hands to save the lost, and to heal the sick, and to deliver those who are in bondage. That's what these hands were created to do. But it all starts with each of us knowing who we are in Christ. I mean, the emphasis of most of my messages is I really want to hammer home so you know who you are in Christ so that you can live up to your potential. You know, God created each and every one of us for this particular time, put us in this particular place. He's got work for us to do with our hands. So we're to be more like Jesus, less of us, more of him. Do less and less of what I would do with my hands and do more and more what Jesus would have you do with his hands. So God wants to touch people through our hands. Think about that. And the scriptures are filled with miracles which were performed simply through laying on of hands. So that's what we're going to do right now with all the little things I handed you out. They're all numbered, so we're going to go through them sequentially. 
We're going to take a little journey through the scriptures to see how Jesus used the power of touch to heal the sick. So who has got number one? This is Matthew. I have number one, right? So if I get <laughs> Nikki, number one warrior in, in all of Virginia Beach for healing the sick and raising the dead. A mighty dynamic warrior. She's got number one. This is a story about how Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. I just have you come up to the mic. Whoever has number two, get ready. We're going to go right through these. Boom, 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 boom. Because that's who you are with your hands. So get your hands ready and find your scripture verse. Matthew 1, chapter 8. I'm sorry, Matthew 8, chapter... Yeah, I had gone Matthew down. 8, verses 14 through 15. Number one. Okay. Wow. Okay, 8. It's verses 14. Jesus heals many people. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever, but when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That's good. So Jesus touched her hand, and the fever left her. Who's got number two? This is Matthew 9, um, verses I do. 27. 29. Come on up. And this is a story of Matthew healing a blind person. Look out, River. 27 through 29. Three, get ready. After Jesus left the girl's home, two blind men followed along behind him, shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. They went right into the house where he was staying, and Jesus asked them, Do you believe I can make you see? Yes, Lord, they told him. We do. Then he touched their eyes and said, Because of your faith, it will happen. And their eyes were open. They just touched their eyes. And they could see. Number three, who's our third reader? This is Mark. Mark chapter 5, verses 22 through 40. She wanted one of the long ones. And God took care of me, heard her, heard her prayer, mm -hmm. and delivered. You can also find the same story in Matthew 9. This is Jesus heals one of the um, synagogue leader's daughters. It's also about the story of the woman with the blood. So read 20 through through 29. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. Jairus. Jairus. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Very good. That's all. We interrupt this reading to jump to Luke because Luke adds a little bit more to the story. So this is Luke chapter 8, verses 45 through 47. So we already saw that he's on his way to see this girl at the synagogue leader's house. Jairus, and on the way he meets this woman with the blood condition. In Luke chapter 8, it adds this. He says, Who touched me? Jesus asked. 
Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Somebody deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out of me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble, and she fell to her knees in front of him, and the whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed just by touching him. So now we pick back up at Mark number 5, 35, 42. We continue the story. So this is why he's still talking to the woman with the blood condition. He was still speaking to her. Messengers arrived from the home, uh, home of Jairus? Jairus. Jairus. Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. So he's telling a Pharisee to have faith. <laughs> then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and sweeping and wailing, or I'm sorry, and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. <clears throat> the crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha come which means, little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. Holding her hand, he says, Talitha Kong, Hebrew, little girl, get up. She rose from the dead just by touching her with his hand. Mark 6.4 is the next reading. It says, and then Jesus told them, this is because he's never accepted back in his hometown. So it says, prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown mm -hmm. and among his relatives and among his own family because of their unbelief. He couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hand on a few sick people and heal them. But he was just amazed at their unbelief. So he couldn't go there and do what he wanted to do. He wanted to heal them all. But he was able to touch a few of them and heal them. So number seven reading is Mark 7. And this is Jesus healing a deaf man. Seven thirty-one through 35. Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so that they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's, man's ears, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephpatha, which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was free so that he could speak plainly. And I'm going to share what a scholar on TVN said, that Jesus put some of his DNA into the man. That's good to know. I never thought about that, but that is good to know. So Jesus put his finger in the man's ears, and he could hear. He put his fingers on his tongue touched the man's tongue, and he was able to speak. He's no longer deaf and dumb. Okay, reading number eight is Mark 8, verse 25 through, no, 22 through 25. If I didn't put that on your thing, it should be 22. 
Mark 8, 22 through 25. Okay. When they arrived at the side of some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Again, we see Jesus taking his hands, putting it on the man's eyes, because he's blind. He can't see, and by doing so, he was able to see. He took two tries. Saw a little bit better the first time, but saw clearly after he put his hand, hands on him that second time. Which moves us to verse 9, reading our scripture 9, Luke 4, verse 40. Remember, Luke is a physician. So he's paying attention to all this healing that's going on. As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Again, just the touch of his hand. Number 10 is... Luke 5, this is Jesus healing a man with leprosy. This is also in the book of Mark, <coughs> chapter 1. In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, <coughs> he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. So he's healing eyes. He's healing speaking, leprosy, dead people. Now we got to go to reading number 11, Luke 6. When they came down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area, surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the sea coasts of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone tried to touch him because healing power went out from him, and he healed everyone. Healing power. That's what we're all trying to be able to have, that same healing power. The twelfth reading is Luke 13. Who's got number 12? This is Jesus healing on the Sabbath in front of the Pharisees. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. I don't think it was a coincidence that Tanya, who's been having back issues and back problems, read that scripture. And we just call forth the same healing for Tanya that took place on that Sabbath day 
For that woman who had been bent over in pain for 18 years, it's not going to happen any time. Verse 13, it's Luke 14, verses 1 through 4. Again, he's healing on the Sabbath day. Oh, now that's where we just were. Number 14, Jesus heals a man born blind. Verses 1 through 7. One through seven, please. Yeah, I have Luke chapter 14, right? Okay, okay, you're right. Luke, I jumped ahead on one. Luke chapter 4, 14, 1 through 4. You're right, right. verse 13. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. There was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in religious law, is it permitted in the law to heal people on the Sabbath day or not? When they refused to answer, Jesus touched the sick man and healed him and sent him away. Just touched the man. Doesn't say he prayed for him. Doesn't say he said anything. He just touched him and healed him. The 14th reading is John 9, 1 through 7. Thank you. Sorry, I got mixed up there. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples, asked him, Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. And he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread mud over the blind man's eyes and told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. So he spread the mud with his hands over the man's eyes. He was able to see. Passed along a little bit of the Holy Spirit DNA. So I just want, we got a couple more to do, but I just want you to see in all of the readings that we have right now that everyone that Jesus touches, he heals them. No matter what condition they have, just by a touch. Sometimes he doesn't say any prayers, but sometimes he says, can you see or stand up or whatever it might be, or, you know, don't sin anymore. But I don't want you to think that only Jesus can touch people and heal them. That's not what I want you to be getting out of these readings. But I wanted you to read these readings because they can tell you a whole lot better than I can what Jesus was able to do with touch. Earlier we saw, we read about the woman with the blood condition. She didn't even touch Jesus. She just touched the hem of his garment. Luke's got number 15. So she touched the hem of his garment. This is what it says about Paul. It doesn't have to be Jesus. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. That explains the power that we have with those little healing cloths that we have mm -hmm. in the prayer room and that we take out on Wednesdays to go to Haka. They've got the power to heal just by touching them. Because they're anointed or ordained for that purpose. We prayed over every one of them. And next is number 16. I think this is kind of a humorous account of Paul's, you know, it looks like Paul likes to talk a lot and he talks so much that he puts people to sleep. So this is 16, On verse the, 7 through 12. It's Acts 20. Yeah, Acts 20. 7 through 12. On the first day of the week, we gathered with local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where he met was lighted with many flickering lamps. 
as Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eticus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Paul went down to Abraham and took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. Then they all went back upstairs, short, shared in the Lord's supper, and ate together. Paul continued talking then until dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home unhurt, and everyone was greatly relieved. So Paul just took him into his arms, just hugged him, brought life back to him just by touching him. Now, hopefully I will never speak for 12, 14 hours and put you to sleep like that. Number 17th reading is Acts 3, verses 1 through 8. This is Peter. He's going to be healing a crippled beggar. So we've looked at Jesus before. Now we're looking at Peter. Oh, you've got to read it. I'm just giving him a... He's a crippled, but he's not a beggar. That's right. Not, not yet. <laughs> Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day, he was put aside the temple gate, the one called the Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what, what I have. In the name of Jesus of, of Nazareth, of Nazarene, Nazareth, Nazarene, Nazarene, get up and walk. <coughs> then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped to, or he jumped up, stood up on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. So this is a man who's been lame his whole life. I mean, he is atrophied. I mean, he has no leg muscles. He's skin and bones in his lungs. You know, usually if you're in a car accident or something like that, you've got to go to physical therapy and you spend months and years learning how to walk again. He just grabbed him by his hand, touched him with his hand, pulled him up, and all that strength came back into his legs where he was jumping up and down and leaping and dancing. So our final reading is Acts 28, verses 8 through 9. That was Peter and Anne. Was it John? Was yeah, Peter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peter and John. As it happened, Publius. How would we say? Is that how you say? Publius's father. Okay. Was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul <laughs> went in and prayed for him, laying his hands on him, and he healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. Again, he just laid his hands on him. That's after he'd been bitten by a snake. So he healed a man from a poisonous snake bite. So there's power in the name of Jesus, but there's power. Jesus' power is also in your hands. You can use your hands to heal others, but your hands carry more power than just to heal others. If you want to, please turn with me to John 8, verse 16. You're going to see there's more power in your hands than just healing. John 8, verse 16. I got page number 860. What was that? 860. 860. So there's more power than just healing people. It says, The Holy Spirit 
had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. What are we? What are we looking at? You said John eight sixteen. Maybe it's one John eight sixteen. Maybe I forgot to put a one there. Well, then I got the wrong scripture verse. I got the right scripture verse, just the wrong where it comes from. I had tons of them, so forgive me. Yeah, maybe that was X. So Peter and John baptized people in the Holy Spirit by laying their hands on them, by touching them. In Acts 19, 6, it must have been in Acts, we see more of this power. It says, Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Now when we read in John 9, we read the story of Saul, who became Paul. He's on his way to Damascus. He's on his way to round up more Christians, throw them in prison, kill them, persecute them. And on his way there, he encounters Jesus. And a bright light comes in. He falls off his horse and he's blinded. And he has a conversation with Jesus. You know, why are you persecuting me? So anyway, Jesus sends him to Damascus and tells him to look for a believer named Ananias. And in verse 17, we read, So Ananias went and found Saul, and he laid his hands on him. And then Ananias says, Brother Saul, now here, Saul's out to destroy all the Christians. He says, Brother Saul, because... Christ had sent him to him. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell off of Saul's eyes and regained his sight. So Ananias laid hands on him, and not only did he heal him of his blindness, but the Holy Spirit fell upon him. The Holy Spirit fell upon Saul. That was probably the beginning of his ministry right there. Filled with the Holy Spirit. So my question tonight is, are you a believer? Do you believe that you have power in your hands? The power to do all things through Christ. Let me read Mark 16 to you. Verses 17 through 18, he says, These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And they drink anything poisonous. It won't hurt them. And they will be able to place their hands on the sick. And they will be healed. So his hands are now your hands. You are the hands of Christ in the world today because he lives inside of you. That power lives inside of you. When you touch somebody with your hands, it's not your power that's going on. It's the power of Jesus Christ. It's that healing, resurrection power that is changing the lives of everybody that you touch. So God has given you two ways for you to minister the gospel, two ways for you to bring about healing. The first is with your voice. When we speak the word of God over people, we can change their life forever. We can command things to leave. We can move mountains. We can command pain to go, cancer to go, 
so we can speak wealth and life and health and wellness. We can cast out demons. We can bind spirits. Matthew 12, 34 reminds us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it speaks life. The other way, like we're looking at tonight, that we can minister healing is through the power in your hands. You've got your mouth, you've got your hands. Acts 14.3, and this is the New King James Version, reads a little bit different, says, Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Where his hands? So God's word tells us that we are new creatures in Christ. You need to know who you are in Christ. And that because we are new creatures, we can use our hands to save the lost, to heal the sick, to deliver the oppressed, to convey strength, to convey gifts of the Spirit, to convey the Holy Spirit, and to finance the end time harvest. We are in the end times right now. Your hands will be bringing in the end time harvest. You are end time warriors and you've got the power of life and death in your hands. Demons and demonic spirits, they fear you. They fear you because they know, they know that you have, that you are carrying a concealed weapon. You are carrying concealed weapons with your mouth and with your hands. You can destroy them. So I want you to hold up your hands again. And I want you to repeat after me. <laughs> Hands up. Repeat after me. These hands have the power to heal the sick. These hands have the power to heal the sick. These hands have the power to set the captives free. These hands have the power to set the captives free. These hands have the power to get wealth and to finance the end time harvest. These hands have the power to get wealth and to finance the end time harvest. These hands conceal God's power. These hands conceal God's power. And these hands hold His word and all of His promises. These hands hold His word and all of His promises. And one of these days, these hands are going to be embracing Jesus Christ himself. Yeah. Deuteronomy 16, 15 says, The Lord shall bless thee in thine increase and in all the works of thine hands. So everything you need is in your hands. There's healing in your hands. You know, it's funny Man. that that's how you ended it because um, when Nikki, Mike, and I went to pray for that guy that's in a coma, his hands yep. were still moving. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I didn't, maybe somewhere in the back of my head, I remember people that are in comas can move, and I didn't remember it that night, and I told Mark before we went in that he was going to squeeze his hand, and he did. Power in your hands. Not only in his hand, but yeah. God's giving the power That's right. to that guy in the coma. Because he could hear, I'm, I just feel oh, yeah. in my soul that he could hear everything oh, yeah. that he He was said. receiving the yeah. healing yeah. power from Mark. Mm -hmm. 
You look at all the people that were ill and afflicted, they were seeking to be touched. He was seeking to be touched. He reached out his hand, mm -hmm. reflex, grab Mark. And he received it. We all believe that he received it. We're going to see that. And I believe if we have done with, like as Jesus did, I believe if we have cleared the room. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is new to us. Yeah. We're, we're 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 just doing this kind yeah. of stuff, and it takes a I don't know what it takes. Well, you don't. But it that. takes a little something to say to everybody in the room. You don't need that unbelieving get spirit. Get out. <laughs> yeah. To be in the room with but them. I won't have any problem next time saying you saw how many examples we read tonight where they cleared the room yep except for the people who believed the the people that not only believed but the people that they wanted to see the resurrection power yeah. and healing usually their parents or whoever it was yeah. Yeah. you stay in the room because nobody else is going to believe this if we go out and tell them they're going to say oh you did something but or somebody else like their mother has said. Yeah, I did, I did that when my dad um, was getting ready to pass away. Um, he had had a do not resuscitate, but they did anyway. And I know that it was so that I could witness to him. Because even though they're in a coma, yeah. they can still hear you. And the spirit's and I had not been, dead. I had been a personal witness to him for years and years and years, but when he did this, you know, went into the coma, I told I told the nurse, I said, I need to have five minutes with my dad by myself, yeah. because my brother and several other people didn't really believe in that and stuff, and so I, I told my dad, I said, you have to make the decision for Christ now, you know, you have to do this now, because Scott and I want to see you in heaven one day, so... You know, I, I had that opportunity to, to just really kind of get on him because they had taken, they had, 